Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm very happy to be back here uh, speaking for the second time on New Jersey uh, in the American Civil War. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know me or weren't here last week, I teach at Rowan University where I'm a professor of history. Uh, I live in Glassboro now, but I'm not a native of Glassboro. I actually grew up in Texas uh, in a little place called Chalk Bluff, which is uh, north of Waco. Um, but I uh, found that I love uh, living in New Jersey much more than I thought I would when I came to New Jersey. And unfortunately, I did not have a positive impression of the state, outside of the state, unfortunately. The reputation is not always what we would like to see, and that was true of me as well. But I've come to find that I quite like it here. Two daughters born here, and uh, I have uh, become a person who uh, quite enjoys studying the history of the state. And I now teach the history of New Jersey and have for uh, many years, and so I'm happy to, uh, to share with you uh, what I've been learning. I think I have an interesting perspective as someone who's not a native of the state, uh, having come from Texas, where they're very proud of their history in Texas. Texas, you know, there's a uh, there's Texas and every, and every place else, right? Uh, you, you have to have your Texas history. You might learn something about the rest of the United States, if, but you know, Texas is critical. Uh, I was always told that in, the, uh, in World War II, the United States and England were lucky to have allies like Texas on their side. Uh, that was the standard line where I grew up. But in any event, uh, we're going to talk about New Jersey today. And I am, for those of you who are not here, I did plan a little bit of a review, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have in this early stage uh, as well. Okay, so last week I began with the, the large question that I'm trying to get at, which is what should we, how should we evaluate New Jersey in the final analysis? Is New Jersey a loyal Jersey blue state? Um, Jersey blue refers to a reference to the American Revolution when the uh, soldiers from New Jersey developed a reputation for their bravery and, and support for the patriot cause. Or is it a traitor state, which is a phrase that was thrown about with regards to New Jersey uh, during the Civil War and after for its uh, opposition to the Lincoln administration and lack of support uh, for uh, the war effort. Uh, historians uh, have been divided uh, on this issue. Early historians uh, writing about this issue uh, tended to focus on the, on the negative and tended to argue that, in fact, New Jersey was a traitorous state or at least more like a border slave state than a free state. Um, Charles Knapp uh, was one of those historians who made that argument. More recently, William Gillette of Rutgers University in New Brunswick has argued that, in fact, uh, Knapp was wrong, and in fact, it was the exact opposite, and New Jersey was really no different than any other free state. And I tipped my hand last week uh, by uh, the not very surprising conclusion that I believe the real answer is somewhere in between uh, for New Jersey. Um, but anyway, we're going to talk about it, and we'll have some time at the end to discuss what you think about it. Uh, one of the things that I thought was critical to do at the beginning is to talk about how New Jersey became a free state, because that division matters a lot uh, in, the, in the Civil War. Uh, I had a slide last week in which I uh, showed the, those states which had slaves, and they were listed in order of the percentage of slaves as a percentage of the population, and that list corresponds almost exactly uh, to the order in which those states joined the Confederacy. The states with the highest proportion of slaves were the first to join the Confederacy. The next four uh, were the ones that joined after Fort Sumter. And the four with the smallest percentage of slave population never joined the Confederacy. And of course, we know that no state, no free state, uh, joined the Confederacy. Um, and that is something that I think uh, should be pointed out. Sometimes people describe the Civil War as a war between the industrial north and the agrarian south, but that's false. If that was true, Iowa would have joined the Confederacy, right? Iowa was no industrial powerhouse in 1860. In fact, the North as a whole was no industrial region. It's really only New York and Philadelphia and Boston and some small parts of, of Northeast that are truly industrialized. Really, industrial America is a late 19th, early 20th century thing. Lincoln is the chosen representative of the North in 1860, and he is not a child of the industrial North. He's a trial of the Illinois Prairie. He's their standard bearer in 1860, and I think that's representative of the northern population. Almost all farmers, and certainly even those who live in cities in 1860, are probably the children of farmers. It's an agricultural nation. So that division doesn't really make sense. So if it's not industrial versus agrarian, if it's something else, 
is it free state versus slave state? And the answer there is, well, it's, it's, that's pretty close to that. Uh, certainly, if you're a free state in 1860, that's going to make a big difference between which side you're on. So how does New Jersey become a free state? And we talked about that. They passed gradual emancipation in 1804. Uh, they were the last of the free states to do so, and sometimes that's brought as a criticism against New Jersey. But I said, if you wanted to keep that in perspective, would you rather be the last of a gradual emancipation movement that began in 1780 and ended in 1804, uh, or never having joined that movement, uh, which is true, for example, of its southern neighbor, Delaware, which actually voted against the 13th Amendment and only freed its slaves in December of 1865, after having voted against the 13th Amendment. Uh, New Jersey did go ahead and pass the gradual emancipation effort. I talked about uh, some of the reasons why. Uh, I mentioned John Woolman and the Quaker abolitionist movement, which I think was important. Um, after it did pass its gradual emancipation movement, uh, New Jersey uh, was relatively moderate on slavery, especially compared to New England, but it did align at the critical moments of crisis with the other free states. When Missouri applied as a slave state, New Jersey said no, voting along with every other free state against Missouri coming in as a slave state. Eventually compromises worked out on that, which New Jersey was a part of, uh, but it sided in a sectional vote with the free states. That happened again in 1846 with the Wilmot Proviso when every free state representative voted for the proviso and every southern representative voted against the proviso. So in the key moments of the sectional crisis, New Jersey falls in line with the other free states. Now they're not as radical as New England, but when it comes down to it, uh, they are, uh, they side with the free states. Okay. Now, of course, many people know uh, that New Jersey was one of the very few states uh, to have a popular vote, in fact, the only free state, to have a popular vote against Lincoln in 1860. The more people voted for Stephen Douglas uh, than did uh, Abraham Lincoln, and that's something that's often brought as a mark against uh, New Jersey. Um, after Lincoln was uh, elected, uh, and secession began, uh, New Jerseyans were actually divided, as we discovered last week, on how to respond. Uh, some uh, supported Lincoln, obviously, but there were many that were worried about war, uh, did not want to force the Confederacy uh, to submit and come back into the Union. Uh, New Jerseyans were quite divided uh, about uh, the issue of how to respond to secession. I argued that uh, in this period, uh, Lincoln was actually quite critical uh, to reaching out to moderate and conservative northerners, in particular to New Jerseyans, to reach out to them uh, to get them to kind of consider uh, supporting the Union cause. And I said there were three uh, kind of key moments uh, in that. Uh, one of those was when he actually visited Trenton. He stopped and gave two speeches uh, in the State House uh, on his way to be inaugurated. And I thought he was very eloquent, as Lincoln almost always is, in reaching out to New Jerseyans. And I think he, in his speech, he understood the value of New Jersey. As the only state that voted against Lincoln, New Jersey had a special place. Uh, they, more than any other free state, could demonstrate that the power of democracy and majority rule uh, still worked in the United States. Because for Massachusetts to support Lincoln is no big deal because Massachusetts wanted Lincoln. So did Illinois. But for New Jersey that voted against Lincoln to show up and support Lincoln as the elected president, even though they voted against him, was important. Um, it wasn't just the winners against the losers. It was the winners and those who lost but still believe in the Union and the Constitution, that's how Lincoln understood it, versus those who didn't believe in the Constitution. So it was important to have New Jersey on his side. As Lincoln believed it was important to have Kentucky and Delaware and Maryland and Missouri on his side. Other states that also voted against him that he wanted very much to keep in the Union. So he understood how important New Jersey was and he wanted to reach out to them and he he did so by uh, referring to the crossing of the Delaware and the patriotic battles of the Revolution. Uh, I think he did so quite eloquently. Uh, but that was only one of I think of three moments that Lincoln uh, was quite wonderful in reaching out to those uh, who did not vote for him. And uh, the second uh, of those moments uh, was his first inaugural address, which didn't please Southerners, uh, and, uh, but I think did uh, mollify some of his critics in the North that in fact Lincoln was not going to be too radical on the issue. He said, 
you can have no war unless you yourselves are the aggressors. Uh, that's what a lot of uh, moderate and conservative New Jerseyans wanted to hear, that he was not going to start a war. Uh, and uh, so he, I think, did, if not win over uh, many of those who opposed him, I think at least uh, kept them listening to him and his administration with his first inaugural address. And then the third uh, moment was the firing on Fort Sumter. Uh, how he handled the firing on Fort Sumter by uh, ordering a, a, a humanitarian relief mission and not a military resupply of Fort Sumter ended up prompting Jefferson Davis to order the firing on Fort Sumter first. That uh, was perceived by Northerners all across the North, including in New Jersey, as an act of war. Shooting on the flag of the United States was for many New Jerseyans beyond the pale. They might have different thoughts about states' rights and about secession, but under no part of their interpretation did they countenance firing on American soldiers uh, under the flag. And so after Fort Sumter, and I think Lincoln gets, should get credit for how he, how he played that, uh, that uh, leads New Jerseyans to unite. Many, many of those who voted against Lincoln uh, come out strongly in support of, of the uh, administration and uh, thousands of soldiers volunteer. And in fact, the legislature, which is controlled by the Democratic Party in opposition to Lincoln, votes somewhat reluctantly uh, for $2 million to support uh, uh, many regiments of soldiers. Okay. However, this unity, which had emerged after Fort Sumter, didn't last too long, unfortunately. Uh, by the time of the first Battle of Bull Run, or after first Bull Run, it had disappeared. First Bull Run was the first major battle of the Civil War, and it was a Confederate victory. In fact, it ended up being a route for the, uh, uh, for the Union because the Union soldiers had not been properly drilled on how to retreat. And so they just broke in disarray, uh, fleeing back to Washington, D.C. Uh, it got very ugly as uh, citizens, civilians, including congressmen, had come out to watch with picnic baskets and wine uh, the one battle that was going to win the Civil War. And as they didn't go that way, uh, their wagons and picnic baskets got, got messed up with retreating soldiers, and uh, it was a disaster. Very embarrassing for the Union. And it gave great encouragement to those who had had to clench their teeth. You could tell in New Jersey there were people who still were uncertain and didn't really want to fight the war, but after Fort Sumter, they had to remain quiet because the clear, the clear majority was in favor of doing something about these folks who had fired on the flag. Well, well, First Bull Run gives them the ammunition, gives them the opportunity to voice their criticisms of the government. And so that's where we're going to pick up uh, today. So I have kind of divided the lecture into two parts. I thought about doing it chronologically, but I, but I ended up abandoning that. First, we're going to talk uh, about the ways in which New Jersey, despite this fracture, despite this division, continues throughout four years of very difficult war to support the Union war effort. In the end, I think this is probably the most important story. Um, so I'm going to start there and make sure that we understand that. But we are going to then, in the second part, look at the ways in which New Jersey, during the war, criticized the Lincoln administration and was not fully supportive of the war effort, in some ways less supportive of the war effort uh, than other states. So uh, that's where we're going to go um, in the second part. Then we'll come back at the end. We'll have uh, some kind of, uh, I'll speculate on why I think New Jersey was so fractured and so divided, uh, more so than other northern states. And then I'll conclude with what I think this uh, means and what the significance of New Jersey is, why, why it's important to study and why I think it's a valuable state uh, to examine in this uh, sesquicentennial uh, celebration of the Civil War. Uh, so any questions about how we're going to proceed? Yes, ma'am. How close was the vote to New Jersey? For a, in 1860? Yes. Uh, it was maybe uh, 4,000 votes, I think, or something like that. It was, I don't know, 53 to 47 percent, something like that. I can't remember off the top of my head. I can look it up. I'll get you, I'll get you the figures. It was close. Yeah, okay. It was close. Yeah. But you would be incorrect. <laughs> you would be incorrect. Yes, you would be incorrect in that. Uh, the northern New Jersey was the place that voted uh, against Lincoln. Against Lincoln. South Jersey was a Republican stronghold. Yeah. Yeah. New Jersey is one of the most unusual places in the country in that it has remained 
South Jersey has remained largely Republican ever since, uh, you know, 1860 or 1856 even. Many other parts of the country have shifted, right? Now, places that used to be solidly Democratic are now solidly Republican, right? And things have switched. But that's not true of South Jersey, which alone among, you know, many of parts of the country have remained solidly Republican. Now, of course, it's not, I wouldn't say it's solidly Republican today, but, but it has more consistency in its Republican support than almost any other region. Alice, I got to move on, so we'll, we'll talk more about this. Uh, at, we'll talk more about this later. Okay. Um, all right. So I want to start with New Jersey soldiers, and of course, I think it's proper to start there. Uh, we're not exactly sure on the number. This is kind of the highest number we think, but I think it's a pretty accurate number. Eighty-eight thousand soldiers served in the Union Army. Fifty-two regiments. Over twenty-three thousand of those soldiers served in the most important army of the North, uh, the Army of the Potomac. About almost 3,000 black New Jerseyans actually served uh, in the war, although they actually went to Philadelphia and joined the United States uh, colored troops there. Uh, most of them did not serve in New Jersey regiments. Uh, and uh, there were 26 Medal of Honor winners, uh, and, and six, 26 soldiers, and six sailors and two Marines uh, that won the Medal of Honor. So New Jersey soldiers have a record they should be proud of uh, for their support uh, of the Union during the war. Uh, of course, uh, not surprising also that New Jersey was involved in industrial production in support of the war effort. Uh, during the war, uh, probably almost 60,000 New Jerseyans uh, directly or indirectly supported the war effort through industrial production. In Patterson, they made locomotive engines and hundreds of thousands of uniforms. Uh, really an amazing number of uniforms uh, that were made in Patterson. Uh, in Trenton and Newark, thousands of swords and bayonets. And in fact, at the peak, at the height of the war, they were pumping out a thousand rifle barrels a day, a week. A thousand uh, rifle barrels a week. And New Jersey is, as important as the industrial production was, it's, it was agricultural production was more important. Uh, it's during the Civil War that Rutgers is actually founded as a, as a scientific school to you know, and, and develop agricultural uh, new techniques. Uh, in fact, New Jersey uses the Civil War to kind of you know, pivot its way forward in agriculture. Really, New Jersey is not uh, nearly as important in agriculture before the war as it becomes after. And it's part because of the transition to vegetable crops that it makes during uh, the Civil War. Um, they, uh, Charles Landis, I just uh, used him as one example. He's somebody who saw this, uh, saw a need to support soldiers and, and promoted uh, vegetable farming in particular. And uh, by 1864, he had sold 1,000 acres of small 15-acre plots uh, to families uh, to produce vegetables for the Civil War armies. Uh, founder of, of Vineland and other, and other uh, colonies in, in the region. All right, last time I mentioned uh, Philip Carney, and we'll discuss him again. I think it's, he is unquestionably uh, New Jersey's greatest soldier, most important soldier uh, during the war. We'll talk about him later. But he's not, he's, it's, he's not without dispute the most important New Jerseyan who supported the Union during the war. Uh, probably uh, that person is William Dayton. Uh, who went to Princeton and he was a lawyer. He was actually, as you can see here, the Republican vice presidential nominee in 1856. How many of you have heard of William Dayton before? Anybody? Now, William Dayton uh, was considered briefly, uh, probably not that seriously, for Secretary of State in the Lincoln Cabinet, uh, but then he was appointed ambassador to France. And uh, that was, uh, there were two critical ambassadorships uh, during the Civil War, both of which mattered a lot. England, of course, and France. Charles Francis Adams uh, was the ambassador to England, and he's, he's the most important diplomat of the war. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but uh, William Dayton is the second most important diplomat, and in some ways he had a harder task because Napoleon III uh, was very sympathetic to the South uh, and wanted to recognize the Confederacy. Uh, and engaged in some kind of crazy operations uh, that worried Lincoln uh, at times about what he was going to do. Uh, but he had a hard time acting on his own without English support. But uh, Dayton had a hard time keeping Napoleon III uh, in check here. Uh, this is an image of actually uh, the, the, the battle for which Cinco de Mayo is celebrated. Most people think of Cinco de Mayo and they get it wrong that it's a Mexican Independence Day. It's actually not. It's actually a victory over the French 
because, during the Civil War years because the French invaded and took over Mexico uh, during the Civil War. They put a puppet emperor on in, in, uh, in charge of Mexico, and, um, and that, that individual was being heavily courted by the Confederacy. They said, look, we'll recognize your puppet government in Mexico if we'll recognize our government in the Confederacy, and Dayton had to deal with, with this. Uh, you know, intrigue uh, south of the border uh, with France. So uh, William Dayton, unknown, but an important figure during the Civil War, uh, keeping the French from recognizing uh, the Confederacy. Uh, many historians agree that if either England or France uh, would have recognized the independence of the Confederacy, they would have been very, very bad uh, for the Union. Uh, it would have meant very difficult things for the blockade. Uh, it, uh, you know, in the American Revolution, of course, we all think of the intervention uh, of the French, the alliance with the French, as being one of the defining turning points of the American Revolution. And probably without French aid, it's hard for us to imagine our winning our independence. Uh, well, I think the Confederacy got very close without any foreign aid. How would they have done with foreign aid? I think you can make the case that uh, diplomacy is very important. So that's William Dayton, who should not be as forgotten as he is. I could have talked about a whole bunch of different regiments. Uh, there were 52, as I said, uh, from New Jersey, but I'm just going to focus on the 12th New Jersey because uh, they participated and had a significant role at the Battle of Gettysburg, the most famous uh, of, of our battles. I don't think the most significant of, our, of the Civil War battles, but you can argue with me about that later. Uh, but it still was a very important battle, and I want to talk about the 12th New Jersey. The 12th New Jersey was mustered at Woodbury, not very far from here. If you uh, had grown up in this area in, uh, in the Civil War years, you, you might have been in the 12th New Jersey. Uh, so they mustered out of Woodbury, and they uh, had their first real combat at the Battle of Chancellorsville. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but that's not a good battle to be your first battle to be in. It was a disastrous Union defeat. Uh, they suffered heavy casualties in that, in that battle. Uh, the next battle they participated in was Gettysburg. They arrived after having performed some screening activities, which they were successful in on the first day. They arrived on the second day at the Battle of Gettysburg, and they were given a mission uh, to clear out this barn and farmhouse called the Bliss Farm today. Uh, one of the things about the 12th New Jersey, they were called the Buck and Ball Regiment because they had smoothbore muskets. A rifle uh, was the premier instrument of the Civil War soldier, and obviously the rifled barrel, the grooved barrel, which sends bullets spinning, is more accurate. In fact, it was, it had, the smoothbore musket was accurate at 50 yards. The rifle was accurate at 250 uh, so obviously you normally wanted to have a rifle, but the smoothbore could come into play if you were in close quarters. You would essentially uh, put uh, some, some spray into your smoothbore and you would just kind of stick it through a window and you know, shoot into the entire thing without aiming. And uh, the uh, 12th New Jersey was one of the regiments that, that had that smoothbore busket skill as well as the rifle skill. And at Gettysburg, they were asked to go clear out the Bliss Farm, which was uh, Confederate snipers were using that area. And uh, sure enough, uh, they, uh, they attack the, the farm and the barn. They capture about 90 Confederate soldiers and clear it out. They burn down the farm so the Confederates can't retake it and use it again. I'm sure the Bliss Farm family was not happy about that, uh, but uh, that's what they did. Uh, they then returned after having, they did that and some of that was overnight because obviously if you're going to sneak up on some snipers, I'd prefer to do that under the cover of darkness. Uh, so that's when they did it. So they, you know, they finished their task you know, in the middle of the night, and they were uh, located uh, in the center of the Union line uh, for the third day. Uh, that turned out not to be a nice resting location. That was the, uh, very close to the center of Pickett's Charge on the third day. So they were heavily involved in Pickett's Charge, uh, repulsing Pickett's Charge on the third day. In fact, that's the monument to the 12th New Jersey, which you can see if you go to Gettysburg, you can find the monument. It's not too far down from the angle. If you've been to Gettysburg, the angle is the place which the, the uh, Armstead and, and the Confederates kind of got furthest up uh, in penetrating the Union lines and Pickett's Charge. It's, there's also the high water mark. It's an open book. That monument, if you've seen that monument, that's there. If you, go, if you look at the high water mark of the Confederacy and the angle, and you keep on going a little bit further down, you'll get uh, to the 12th New Jersey's monument. Not the largest or most impressive, but a significant monument to men who did uh, heroic work 
uh, on uh, at the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, they went on to continue to fight in all the rest of the battles of the war. Uh, by the end of the war, about 1,500 uh, people had served in this regiment because as they would get uh, injuries, they would be replaced by other recruits. Uh, of those 1,500 that served in the 12th New Jersey, about 400 uh, were discharged for disabling wounds or killed. Uh, and uh, that's a high ratio of casualties. That's higher than the average for the Union. So the 12th New Jersey uh, paid more than its share of blood uh, in service to the Union. So New Jersey should be rightly proud of the 12th. Um, I'm now going to shift directions a little bit and talk about women uh, and their support of the Union during the war. This is a memorial also at Gettysburg uh, to the women who served, and in, in, in the case of, of uh, Gettysburg, largely as nurses uh, in support of the Union war effort. Um, but it wasn't just nurses, there were others. Uh, Rebecca Buffum Spring was a Quaker abolitionist, uh, utopian dreamer who wanted to reform lots of different things. Uh, and she had a school prior to the Civil War, which she turned into a military academy uh, during the Civil, the Civil War. Uh, she's a very interesting person. She's uh, uh, in some ways kind of a, a strong feminist who believes in kind of the, uh, the women should have a public role. And uh, she actually is one of the people who goes to Harper's Ferry and actually recovers John Brown's body and brings it back for burial. Uh, but on the other hand, she actually disagrees with women who wear skirts that don't uh, drag on the ground. She thinks that's improper, and she has, a, has a, some conservative ideas about behavior and dress and those kinds of things. Uh, she, um, she's an interesting, interesting person. Um, any event, um, this is Arabella Griffith Wharton Barlow, and uh, I'll just read this. She was a Civil War nurse who paid... Uh, the ultimate price. Uh, born February the 29th, 1824 in Somerville, New Jersey, Arabella Barlow served as a nurse throughout the Peninsula, Antietam, and Gettysburg campaigns. In 1861, she married General Francis Barlow, whom she twice nursed back to life from grievous wounds. She nursed at hospital sites at Fredericksburg, Port Royal, White House, and City Point with no thought but for those who were suffering and dying all around her. But she contracted typhus fever, and died in the service of her country on July the 27th, 1864. So sometimes we think of men as the only ones who died in service to the country. But obviously, if you're a nurse treating uh, soldiers, and uh, these places are, you know, disease killed two for every one soldier who died of battle wounds, obviously women uh, can contract those diseases as well. And there's an example of a woman who died serving New Jersey and the Union. Uh, this is Cornelia Otis Hancock. Uh, she's from South Jersey. She's also a Quaker. Uh, she was born in 1840 when the Civil War began. She had just turned 21. Uh, her family were abolitionists and all of her brothers were serving in the Union Army and other uh, capacities for the government. She wanted to support uh, the Union war effort as well. She was not, uh, this was not not every Quaker family in South Jersey did, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And, you know, many Quaker families did not uh, support the war because of their pacifist leanings, but the Hancock family did. Uh, she applied uh, to become a nurse, uh, but she was turned down. Uh, and I'll read to you the, uh, the restrictions on being a nurse during the Civil War. Uh, Dorothea Dix, the superintendent of the, of the nurses, uh, had a policy, no woman under 30 need apply to serve in government hospitals. All nurses are required to be plain looking. Their dresses must be brown or black with no uh, bows, curls, jewelry, and no hoop skirts. And Hancock was turned away, quote, on account of her youth and rosy cheeks. Uh, she, she was deemed to be too attractive to men in the service and would be more distraction than good uh, for, for soldiers. Uh, but she didn't take no for an answer. She realized that at some point there was going to be a battle someplace uh, that was going to be so overwhelming with the casualties that they would not turn down someone who showed up just on the battlefield. And that's exactly what she did. She went to Gettysburg, and she just showed up, and sure enough, they didn't turn her away because she was too young. They said, come on in, and you can help take care of these wounded uh, people. So she served in the army in the, uh, as a nurse uh, throughout the rest of the war. Uh, there's a monument not to, uh, to Ms. Hancock, but to the hospital, Camp Letterman, that she worked at at Gettysburg, although that 
is truly hard to find uh, if you go to Gettysburg, uh, not on the battlefield. Okay. All right, so that ends the positive, happy, feel-good part of today's lecture. Uh, now we turn to those New Jerseyans who unfortunately were not so supportive of the war effort, who opposed the Lincoln administration in one way or another. Okay, uh, and then we'll, we'll return to, I think, uh, kind of a more balanced assessment at the end, but right now we're going to have to face the fact that many New Jerseyans uh, were not as supportive uh, as we might have liked today. Uh, and I mentioned already the importance of First Bull Run is kind of turning uh, uh, opinion, not just in New Jersey, all over the North, really, but especially in New Jersey, uh, against the war effort. Uh, there were about 5,000 casualties, which, judged by later battles, is small potatoes. But at the time, 5,000 casualties was, was, was big. That was a lot of casualties uh, at that time. And so uh, that was considered horrific. Of course, it was also a defeat. Uh, and uh, it's important to understand today that we, th we know now that the North won. And in fact, if I had to make a, a kind of assumption based on my own students who I teach every year the Civil War, I would say most of them now believe that Northern victory was inevitable that the North was destined to win, that there's no way the North could have lost, that all they would have had to do is take their second hand out from behind their back and smash the South with that. Northern victory uh, was foreordained. Uh, but that's not actually how it was seen at the time. Now, it may or may not be true, depending on our perspective today, we can talk about it, but that was not uh, what was necessarily believed in 1861. Of course, you had Northerners who believed that they were going to win, and you had Southerners who believed they were destined to win. So you really want to get some kind of assessment. You need to go outside of the United States. And if you look at the London Times, the most important English language paper in the world, the London Times predicted that the Confederacy would win her independence. The London Times said no war of independence has ever terminated unsuccessfully, except in such cases as the disparity of force was far greater than it is in this case. Just as we had to give up conquering the colonies during the Revolution, so too will the North have to give up conquering the South. So many people believed it was a fool's errand to try to defeat the Confederacy. It was not possible. And that must be kept in mind as you're trying to understand those who oppose the war effort in New Jersey. They believe it's a, it's a waste of treasure and lives. And it's an impossibility to win. And if you, are, if you can put yourself in that mindset that you believe it's impossible to win, then perhaps you can get into their minds a little bit and see why they opposed uh, the war, at least some of them. Many reasons opposed the war, but I think that's a big one for many people. In any event, uh, here uh, are some quotes. I think I gave these last week about the, the plummet of morale after First Bull Run. A uh, soldier from uh, Woodbury, Woodbury Constitution, he wrote to, uh, to the paper, says, we believe all is lost and the government is ruined. In the Newark Journal, said the North is destined to sure defeat. Okay, um, Pretty negative stuff early in the war. Uh, the opposition to the war in this early part, you, you could, a lot of criticism of the government. Uh, the New York Tribune and many other northern papers believe New Jersey uh, was a copperhead state. The New York Tribune said, in no other free state are disloyal utterances so free and bold as in New Jersey. Uh, there were three different types of uh, kind of opposition uh, to the Lincoln administration. There were copperheads, which technically should truly be only those people who actively aided the Confederacy and wanted the Confederacy to win. Um, but in reality, the Republicans would, would call anybody who opposed the Lincoln administration a copperhead. A uh, peace Democrat was somebody who wanted to uh, immediately stop fighting call an armistice and start negotiating somehow uh, to kind of alleviate the differences and, you know, maybe reunite the Union, but if that was not possible, independence of the Confederacy was okay for many of them, right? Uh, try to negotiate, try to keep the Union together, uh, but if that failed, it wasn't worth fighting uh, to preserve the Union for many of them. Uh, and then the regular Democrats believed that it was not acceptable uh, to allow uh, the Union to be dissolved, but they also did not like the way the Lincoln administration was going about conducting the war. They were very critical of the Lincoln administration. They didn't support peace, 
uh, but they didn't support how the Lincoln administration was fighting it. They were critical of things, for example, as we'll discover later, say, for example, the Emancipation Proclamation was something they were very critical of. Then I, didn't, I don't have this group on here, the War Democrats. A War Democrat is somebody who's a Democrat before 1860, voted for Douglas perhaps, but is now uh, very supportive of fighting the war, supportive of the Lincoln administration. Even if they disagree with the Lincoln administration, they don't believe in vocally uh, criticizing the government, maybe only privately suggesting a different course of action, but not a public criticism of the government at this point. That's a war Democrat. So a war Democrat is not someone who is, 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 should be considered part of the opposition. They, should, they, they are part of uh, supporting uh, the war effort. Okay. Colonel James Wall of Burlington. He is the most famous of the peace Democrats uh, during uh, this period from New Jersey. Uh, he is uh, actually from Trenton, born in Trenton. He was educated at Princeton, as many folks were. He moved to Burlington, where he became involved in politics and was a lawyer. Uh, he was a Breckinridge supporter in 1860, which gives you some clue. If you remember, John Breckinridge was the candidate of John C. Calhoun in the Deep South. All right, and uh, so he was the he supported the most pro-Southern of all the four uh, candidates in 1860, and he was, a, he was an ardent peace Democrat. Um, he had uh, written some anti-government editorials, and for this, uh, President Lincoln uh, threw him in jail and uh, did not allow him to see a lawyer and did not charge him with the crime. He imprisoned him in Fort Lafayette, and he suspended the writ of habeas corpus. The writ of habeas corpus is, of course, the fact that, you know, if you're arrested, you must be charged with a crime. You must be able to, you know, go before a judge. And uh, Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus and said, this civil right does not apply to traitors to the Union, and we will, we will, we will go, gun, you know, we will go get mo on these people, to use a modern-day uh, vernacular, is what they did with, uh, with James Wall. So he was put in Fort Lafayette, but he eventually was released after he agreed to sign a pledge of loyalty to the United States. Um, and uh, he uh, then re rejoined the Peace Democrats. I don't know if this is exactly what Lincoln had in mind when he had him sign the loyalty oath. Uh, he wrote this in the New York Times. You can go ahead and look at the New York Times, and this is a letter uh, from James Wall. The final settlement of the legality of my incarceration must go before the legal tribunals of the country at the proper time. There, if the great principles of constitutional liberty are not a delusion and a snare, and our boasted freedom a sham, may yet be found a place of refuge for liberty against despotism, the oppressed from the oppressor. Uh, and James Wall was supported in this. Uh, there were many, many New Jerseyans, and, and not all of them peace Democrats, who thought it was quite wrong to throw someone in jail without... Uh, having a trial, a lawyer, charge, uh, suspending the writ of habeas corpus uh, for many New Jerseyans was, was not uh, something that should be supported. Uh, they argued that what kind of union are we preserving if we throw out uh, these democratic principles along the way. Um, but um, uh, Wall was not interfered with again. In fact, he actually uh, became U.S. Senator uh, from New Jersey in 1863. Uh, as we will uh, soon learn, continued to oppose the Lincoln administration uh, throughout the war. Uh, Lincoln was not done with uh, his uh, tamping down on dissent. Uh, he uh, suppressed newspapers that were critical of the war effort. He brought the editors of all of these newspapers up on charges of treason and convened a grand jury uh, against these editors. Now, a grand jury actually ended up not bringing charges of treason against these editors, uh, but the grand jury warned New Jersey citizens not to purchase their papers or advertise uh, in them. Uh, so this was once again, you know, a, a hardline tactic uh, by the Lincoln administration against those who dissented uh, against the government. We don't think about this with Lincoln, and Lincoln in our mind is a perfect saint, uh, and, uh, but he made mistakes and he did things that we are uncomfortable with, even though we don't like to talk about them. Um, I will say that he didn't treat New Jerseyans nearly as bad as he treated Marylanders. Marylanders were, you know, that was a whole different ball game. He didn't want Maryland to join the Confederacy. If that would have happened, Maryland would have surrounded Washington, D.C. So he has simply established martial law in Maryland. He threw people, he had a list of people that he thought were sympathetic to the Confederacy and he just threw them in jail. And, uh, and it once again suspended the writ of habeas corpus for them. He, he actually had a meeting with one of them, at least 
I don't think it's an apocryphal story. It's too good. Hopefully, it's not apocryphal. Uh, but supposedly, he met with one of these folks, and he said, there are two possibilities. A, you're a traitor to your country, and I don't feel bad about throwing you in jail without your civil rights. Or B, you're actually a loyal supporter of the country, in which case you should thank me, because I'm allowing you to serve your country in a nice jail cell instead of on the front lines of what appears to be a very bloody war. And uh, they didn't laugh at that, apparently. But uh, you know, anyway, that was Lincoln trying his best with humor in those situations. Uh, they had a vote in Maryland, should Maryland secede and join the Confederacy. But to vote, it was not a secret ballot. You had to go up and pick uh, a colorful paper so you could clearly see which side you were voting on. I don't know if it was blue for the Union and gray Confederacy. I don't think it was those colors, but whatever. You get the idea. You could easily tell. And to pick up your ballot, you had to do that right in front of a Union soldier armed with a rifle. I don't think that was a free election in Maryland. Uh, anyway, so Wall got off pretty, pretty well. I mean, New Jersey didn't have this kind of, you know, didn't treat it like Maryland. But in any event, uh, that's, that's what happened to these folks. So there was some suppression in New Jersey. Uh, if morale was low after first bull run, it gets even lower uh, in 1862. And I'm just going to talk about some of the, the battles that New Jersey soldiers were fighting in and that New Jersey citizens were reading about. Uh, the, most of the newspaper coverage in New Jersey centered on what was happening between the new general in charge of the Army of the Potomac, George McClellan, uh, who was actually a kind of a favorite son of New Jersey from Philadelphia, actually would become governor of New Jersey after the war, um, and Robert E. Lee, who eventually uh, becomes in charge of the Army in Northern Virginia. And uh, they're fighting in what's called the Peninsula Campaign, 1862. McClellan actually does pretty well early on in the campaign, gets very close to Richmond, so close to Richmond he can hear the bells of Richmond tolling. Uh, Jefferson Davis said to Robert E. Lee, where are we to locate the Confederate capital now? It appears very soon that General McClellan will force us to evacuate. And Lee says, Richmond must not be evacuated. We will force McClellan out. Uh, Lee attacked McClellan at the Seven Days and even though McClellan's army fought well, uh, McClellan uh, and his fatal flaw was not to have his pulse on the popular feeling about things. And so he retreated every day in the seven, in every day of the seven days, he kept on backing up, uh, getting into better defensive position. And in fact, he, he did inflict tremendous casualties on Lee. The climactic battle of the seven days was Malvern Hill, where the Confederacy went up a, 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 st a stiff incline into entrenched Union defenders, and the Union defenders blew them away. But despite that, McClellan still retreated at the end of the day to an even better position. And uh, McClellan thought this was great. Lee's men are coming out of their trenches at Richmond and attacking me, and I'm doing great damage to them at modest cost to my own army. Actually, it was pretty significant cost to his own army, but not as much as he was inflicting. Very rare for the Union Army to inflict more casualties on the Confederates than for the Confederates to inflict on them. That didn't happen very often. Uh, so he thought he was doing great. But unfortunately... Uh, the war, in the Civil War, it really matters how things are perceived in the press. And what they read was, somehow, somehow, McClellan has retreated for seven consecutive battles, has lost seven consecutive battles. And McClellan completely lost the support uh, of, of the Northern populace during this period, especially the Republicans. Uh, he lost the support of Abraham Lincoln. And, uh, and Lincoln ordered him uh, removed from command and replaced by John Pope. Unfortunately, uh, for John Pope, uh, once uh, McClellan was ordered to retreat off the peninsula, Lee turned around and immediately attacked Pope and destroyed Pope, uh, much more than he'd ever destroyed McClellan, and that was at the Battle of Second Bull Run. And this is one of the very, very low moments for the Civil War. After the seven days, after McClellan's been repulsed, and after Pope's army has been destroyed, uh, really, there has been no Union victories in the Eastern Theater, and that's the only one that many people in the North care about. Yes, there's stuff happening in the West, and Lincoln is so mad. We're doing all these great things in the West. People are like, I never heard of this Ford in Kentucky. Who cares? You know, they really care most about what's happening in the Eastern Theater, and uh, that's also true for England and France. Is that after Second Bull Run is when England and France say, look, it looks like it's a bloodbath in the United States, and we thought at the beginning that the Confederacy uh, was going to win, and it appears they're winning. We need to intervene for humanitarian reasons to stop the killing. And they were this close to coming in, stopping the blockade, telling the North it's over. You have to recognize that. We're sorry. And ending the war. Uh, I think they would have ended the war if they would have done that. Uh, but they said, let's give the North one more chance. 
one more chance. If they, if they can somehow win the next battle, we don't think they will, but if they can win the next battle, we'll, we'll delay this. So that this is the, the very low moment uh, for, for the Union. Um, we're going to stop here and talk about General Philip Kearney. I said he's the most important soldier from New Jersey. Uh, he's serving in the Army of the Potomac. Uh, he's serving under McClellan. He does not like McClellan at all. He calls McClellan the Virginia Creeper uh, because he's so slow. Uh, and he, uh, he has this, after McClellan orders the retreat at Malvern Hill, uh, he says there are only two possibilities for an order for retreat from this position. One is cowardice and the other is treason. Um, and uh, that kind of made Lincoln happy. He's like, I don't know, this Carney guy might be my man. And in fact, Philip Carney was being considered by Lincoln for a possible replacement to General McClellan. Uh, and unfortunately for the Union Army, I think, uh, Carney was killed. Uh, he was killed at the Battle of uh, Chantilly right after uh, uh, Second Bull Run. Um, he was killed in part because of his bravery. He only had uh, one arm. He had lost one arm in the Mexican War. But despite that, he would get onto his horse with his one hand raised, and he would yell as he went into battle, you know, boys of New Jersey, follow me. I'm a one-armed son of a gun. Well, sometimes translated differently. Uh, but anyway, uh, he said, follow me. They'll shoot at me on my horse before they'll shoot at you. Be brave, boys of New Jersey. Follow me. And unfortunately, they did shoot at him, and they killed him uh, at the Battle of Chantilly, uh, depriving the Union of a, a possibly uh, an important commander who might have made a difference. Uh, certainly, I think it's impossible for Kearney to have performed uh, worse than the next three Union generals that would be in charge of the Army of the Potomac. The next one, the one who comes back in charge after Pope, after Kearney is killed, is none other than George McClellan again. Lincoln said, we have to use the tools that are available to us. And he puts McClellan uh, back in charge. Uh, so things look bleak, but sometimes things can take a strange turn in war. And they did so at the Battle of Antietam. The very slow Virginia creeper McClellan was given a gift. Uh, Lee's battle plans were accidentally left behind at a field in Frederick, wrapped in cigars. An extra copy had been made. You know, they make copies of battle plans given to all the generals, right? Well, one, they had made, accidentally made two copies of the plan for one general. Uh, so they made an extra copy. And they normally actually always count. We got all the copies. You know, and they, don't, they don't normally leave battle plans. They're pretty good about it. You don't want to leave your battle plans laying around. They're pretty good. But in this case, they'd accidentally left a copy of the battle plans. It goes even crazier than that because the battle plans were copied by a Confederate officer who happened to be roommates with a Union officer who served on McClellan's staff. And so when the battle plans were shown to McClellan, person on McClellan's own staff could confirm, yes, these were actually written by my roommate from West Point. I'm talking, this is a, this is a small coincidence. It's also at this time when Lincoln seems to be making a turn uh, to believing that God is deciding events uh, in the Civil War. Uh, he, you know, of course, when what I said about England and how close England is to recognizing the Confederacy, that uh, it's a critical moment. And the very slow-moving McClellan, what's his chances of him moving quickly and intercepting Lee, stopping Lee from invading Pennsylvania without the battle plans? I can tell you there's no historian who believes McClellan without these plans is going to move and block Lee. Right? Uh, are we... Wrong to judge Lincoln for believing that God was at work and leaving the plans on the field. Um, in any event, the Battle of Antietam, McClellan defeats Lee, although uh, many people believe McClellan should have done better. He should have crushed Lee, should have destroyed Lee. He didn't, but he did stop Lee, forcing Lee to retreat. And that is a Union victory which gets England and France uh, to agree to not uh, recognize the Confederacy, at least at the moment. It also allows for Lincoln to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, which he had been wanting to do. He'd been wanting to issue the Emancipation Proclamation, but William Seward had said that you need a victory. You cannot issue the Emancipation Proclamation uh, without a victory. Otherwise, it will seem uh, not the moral document that you want. So uh, Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation uh, five days after the, the Battle of Antietam. Once again, uh, Lincoln believes the hand of God is at work. Uh, because if McClellan had actually done better, if he had destroyed Lee's army at Antietam, the war might have been over. 
the war is over before the Emancipation Proclamation is issued, there's no end of slavery. But in fact, Lincoln said God maybe perhaps got exactly what he wanted, which is no Confederate victory, but no Union real victory either, because apparently the Lord wants the war to continue until we do something more with slavery. I think that's how Lincoln came to understand it. Uh, whether or not we agree uh, uh, with that interpretation, I think that's what Lincoln came to believe at this point in time. Now, that's not what New Jerseyans, however, came to believe. Uh, they were very upset. Uh, and in 1862, they were unhappy with the war, uh, despite Antietam, and they uh, voted for Democrats. Four of the five House seats uh, went to Democrats, and in fact, James Wall, the peace Democrat, outspoken critic of the government, was sent to the U.S. Senate. And Joel Parker, a Democrat, was elected governor. So New Jersey uh, continues to be highly critical of the war and the Lincoln administration. There is an image of Joel Parker. Historian William Wright said that of all the nation's governors, Joel Parker was one of the Lincoln administration's most outspoken critics. Okay. He particularly did not like the Emancipation Proclamation, and many New Jerseyans did not like the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, I'll give you just one quote. I could give you many for New Jerseyans who did not like the Emancipation Proclamation, but here's one from Trenton Judge David Narr, who said, we are cutting each other's throats for the sake of a few worthless Negroes. Um, that was a sentiment held by many in New Jersey, many in uh, uh, this, the, the Army as well. There were many in the Army, including McClellan. One of the reasons why McClellan... Um, has suffered, his reputation has suffered uh, subsequently by historians is that uh, he's not a, a good person. If you read his letters, he's arrogant, uh, he's a racist, and he's not likable. I think he's been overly criticized. Uh, as an historian, I think I'm, I'm able to overcome those weaknesses and judge him uh, on his accomplishments, good and bad. Uh, but because he was arrogant, I mean, I'll tell you how arrogant he was. The president came to see him while he was in Washington, D.C., and uh, the, the butler said, well, General McClellan is not here yet. And Lincoln said, fine, I'll wait for him. And Lincoln was in the waiting room. General McClellan came in. The butler said, the president's waiting for you. He said, I'm too tired. He went up and went to sleep. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's McClellan. You can see why people do not like this man. Uh, but in any event, um, McClellan was heavily opposed uh, to the Emancipation Proclamation, as was uh, Trenton Judge uh, David Narr. Lots of other folks, too. Morale continues to plummet in New Jersey. Things go from bad to worse. You had the, you had the kind of life-saving victory at Antietam, but after that, things returned to dismal uh, for uh, the, the Union. Ambrose Burnside's put in charge. I won't go into great details, but the Battle of Fredericksburg is one of the worst Union defeats of the entire war. Burnside has been told he must be different than McClellan. He must attack. He gets to Fredericksburg, Lee is dug in in high ground behind a wall uh, in trenches and because he's been told he has to attack, he orders 14 consecutive charges against ground that cannot be taken. It's suicide. They said that the soldiers fell uh, like snow melting on warm ground. Uh, the Union lost some, some 11,000 casualties. Um, he was removed from command, and in charge was placed Joe Hooker, fighting Joe Hooker, also charged uh, with uh, dealing a blow to Lee. Uh, at this point, uh, Hooker thought that he was going to be able to do that. He was arrogant as well, uh, something shared in common by quite a few of these generals. Hooker said, God should have mercy on Robert E. Lee, for I will have none. My plans are perfect. To which Lincoln replied, as Lincoln is wont to do, the hen is the wisest animal of creation, for she only clucks when the egg is laid. <laughs> Let's see you beat Robert E. Lee before you start clucking, Mr. Hooker. Well, of course, uh, there was no clucking uh, from Hooker as Lee, with only 60,000 troops, defeated Hooker's 130,000 troops in the Battle of Chancellorsville, destroying, routing uh, his army. Uh, another miserable uh, defeat. Uh, then uh, Lee decides to invade the North. Uh, morale is very low. And what is New Jersey going to do as actually the North is now invaded? Well, here's what Governor Joel Parker said when Lincoln asked for more troops. The people of New Jersey are apprehensive that the invasion of the enemy may extend to her soil. 
We think that the enemy should be driven from Pennsylvania. There is now certainly great apathy under such fearful circumstances. That apathy should be removed. The people of New Jersey want McClellan at the head of the Army of the Potomac. If that cannot be done, then we ask that he may be put at the head of the New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania troops now in Pennsylvania, defending these middle states from invasion. If either appointment be made, the people would rise in mass. So uh, this is the governor of a state saying to Lincoln, you should put our choice in charge of your army, and if not, we may be apathetic, despite the fact that the Confederacy is invading Pennsylvania, right? You need to remove the apathy that we have. Uh, I think this is pretty stunning, right? I, I, don't, I, I think you know, um, it's somewhat understandable when you're sending troops to Virginia to fight, uh, but you would think that New Jersey would not be apathetic in responding uh, to an invasion of Pennsylvania. Ironically, Pennsylvania itself was apathetic in its response. Pittsburgh said, we were not going to provide any more troops unless Philadelphia provides more troops. Philadelphia said, we're not going to provide any more troops unless Harrisburg provides more troops. Harrisburg says, what is Philadelphia doing? And they didn't provide as many troops. Actually, it was like Massachusetts and New England that actually sent the extra troops to help defend Pennsylvania and, and Ohio and places like that. Uh, so it was, a, it was a mess because uh, morale was so low. Another thing that was making morale very low uh, during this period of time, and it remains low even after the victory at Gettysburg, is the draft. New Jerseyans hated the draft. Uh, there actually was never was a draft in New Jersey, which sometimes I think by someone like William Gillette is, is used incorrectly as proof that New Jersey was very loyal and very supportive of the Union. Actually, the opposite is true. There was no draft in New Jersey because if they would have tried a draft, it would have been disaster. Here's what Martin Ryerson said about a draft in New Jersey. Should the attempt be made at this juncture to enforce the draft in New Jersey, you may be sure it will be met by a widespread and organized resistance. Uh, it was, they tried the draft in the rest of the North, and there were riots all over. There were riots in Vermont and New Hampshire and Boston and New York, Ohio. There were riots everywhere, and there weren't riots in New Jersey because they didn't dare try it. They didn't dare try a riot in New Jersey. Uh, the draft, highly unpopular in part because uh, you could buy a substitute with money. You could get out of service if you were rich. Uh, that did not go over well with the Irish, who were the primary rioters uh, during this period. Um, but it's not just the poor uh, that are upset. Both houses of the New Jersey State Legislature in 1863 passed peace resolutions claiming that the war was being fought for unconstitutional and partisan purposes. So this means the New Jersey legislature has moved from being regular Democrats, critical of the Lincoln administration, but still supportive of the war, to now being a peace Democrat legislature. Right? Uh, and that's also, that's, that's unusual. New Jersey is the only state that during the entire war has a democratically elected legislature for the entire time. Only free state. Okay. Um, if you, you keep on thinking things are going to get better, but no, they don't. <laughs> they continue to be very bad, especially in the Eastern Theater. Uh, morale uh, once again plummets. It uh, you know, you know, seems like you know, it had been stabilized a little bit with Gettysburg and also news from the west of Vicksburg, uh, but it, it gets very bad in the spring of 1864. Um, uh, there's five invasions of the South that are planned by Grant. Grant plans five separate invasions, and I'll just go through them very quickly to show you how they're doing. One is Nathaniel Banks, who's supposed to take Mobile, but he decides to help out his friends in the textile industry by trying to grab some cotton in Texas, but he fails, doesn't even get started. Sherman said of his campaign, it was one damn blunder from beginning to end. So that's, the, that's, that's one of the five invasions of uh, the South. Another one was led by Benjamin Butler. He was supposed to put pressure on Richmond uh, from uh, the South, uh, he actually was supposed to follow McClellan's old peninsula strategy, and he moved quickly, unlike uh, McClellan, but he moved so quickly that he actually ran onto an island and got bottled up, and a few Confederates could actually pin his entire army down, and for the rest of the fighting, his whole army was pinned in, essentially in their own prison of their own making because he moved too quickly. Uh, he was called Spoons because supposedly his men took spoons from New Orleans during the Civil War. From, um, Franz Sigel, a German general, he was put in charge of uh, attacking in the Shenandoah Valley. He was supposed to clear out the Shenandoah Valley, defeat Jubal early. Uh, he actually did better than Banks and Spoons. He actually had a battle. He just lost, uh, but actually got to fight, uh, which was actually an improvement. But you can see three of the four not doing too well. 
Then you look in the Army of Tennessee and William Tecumseh Sherman. He's against Joe Johnston. His goal is Atlanta. Uh, actually, Sherman is doing pretty well, but no one really knows that at the time because Sherman actually does not like to fight. He likes to move and march. He doesn't actually like to commit his troops to battle because when it happens, they get killed. And Sherman, I think, is like most of us. Uh, even though he has a reputation for being the most ferocious general, he's actually, he, he hates to have his soldiers killed. He doesn't really hate to kill rebels. That's different. Uh, but he hates to have his own men uh, killed. He does one frontal attack at Kennesaw Mountain, and he loses. He never has another frontal attack again in the entire war. He just moves his men, and he's a brilliant master of logistics. He moves his men, gets in a position where the Confederates are untenable, and they have to retreat. Then he moves again, gets in a position where they have to retreat. He moves again, they have to retreat, and he forces Johnston back without having any battles. But it's go it goes slow. I mean, if you're going to do this, move and move, move, move. It doesn't go that fast to keep on moving your whole army of 100,000 men. So it takes a while. So the summer is going on, and people are like, what's going on with... Sherman, he's only had one battle, he lost that, what's he doing? He's actually doing well, but it's not perceived by the average person reading the newspapers, right? So people in the North aren't really happy with what's going on. To, make, to be fair, the Confederate people are very unhappy with Johnston as well, because they know that Sherman is getting closer uh, to Atlanta. Then we get to the fifth of the invasion. So you have four invasions, three of them are disasters, one's not going that well from the from the you know, layman's perspective. Then you have the big one, Grant versus Lee in what's called the Overland Campaign. You know, Grant's objective to defeat Lee, the Army of Northern Virginia, and take Richmond. How's that going in the Overland Campaign? Well, uh, it's very bloody. Um, uh, Lee has a bunch of veteran soldiers who know how to kill. Uh, he has them dug in and entrenched positions, and Grant sends his army at them time and time again. Grant is different than Hooker and Burnside in that uh, when he suffers these tremendous casualties, he doesn't disengage and go back to Washington, D.C. or go back to his camp. He continues to attack. Every day for six weeks, he attacks Lee constantly. But the cost in lives is fantastic. At the beginning of the conflict, he has about 114,000 soldiers. After six weeks of fighting, he suffered 65,000 casualties. Mary Todd Lincoln calls him the butcher, right? And people call for Grant's head. It should be removed. Lincoln says, no. I need this man. I will trust him and I will stay with him. But eventually, after Cold Harbor, uh, he marches for Petersburg and even Grant recognizes that he can't continue to attack. He settles in at Petersburg for a siege and uh, he stalls out at Petersburg. Uh, so as the summer of 1864 drags on, all five invasions seem to have failed. Grant, only thing he has to show uh, is a little bit of territory and 65,000 casualties, but no Richmond, and Lee's not defeated. Sherman still hasn't taken Atlanta, all these other campaigns. Uh, I think this is the lowest point uh, of morale in the entire war. Uh, things are looking very bad. So what happens? Well... I chose this time to talk about desertion. Um, this is one of the things that is uh, kind of one of the facts about New Jersey um, that stands out. Uh, New Jersey's desertion rate uh, is the second highest uh, in, the, in the Union Army. It's uh, just right behind Maryland. Uh, it's just slightly ahead of Delaware. Uh, and uh, those are states that, of course, had slavery. Um, New York... Uh, it's pretty high, uh, but not as high as New Jersey. And Pennsylvania, uh, which is geographically just as close to the fighting as New Jersey really, uh, is, is much lower. Uh, so here, once again, you see that it looks like New Jersey, for some reason, uh, is not quite as committed uh, as other uh, states are uh, to the cause. Now, many reasons for doing this, uh, that this is true. Some of those are general to all the people who deserted, right? Lack of pay, uh, disease, uh, death, uh, opportunities to make money in war industry or in agriculture, which you can make during the war. Uh, all of those are true. There's a couple of things about New Jersey that I think uh, also are a little different. One uh, is that New Jersey is geographically closer to the fighting. It's easier to get home 
uh, than it is if you lived in Vermont or New Hampshire or someplace like that. So I think that probably makes a little difference. But of course, Pennsylvania, for mo a lot of Pennsylvania, is not that much further. So that's, that's not a complete explanation. Uh, there also are some opportunities for, for agriculture, for, for ordinary people in New Jersey. They're probably a little different uh, than some of the other places. You can make more money uh, than you can if you can go home. So there are a couple of reasons. But I think probably the most important one is that the news that New Jersey soldiers get from home is, is less than 100% supportive, right? It's a democratic uh, legislature. Uh, a lot of newspapers are hostile and critical of the war. And uh, if they're reading letters or they're reading newspapers from home, their newspapers in general are not as supportive of the war effort as maybe other uh, states might be. Plus, I think they get the impression that if they go home and desert, they're not going to be judged as, as dishonorably as maybe they would if they were from another state, right? That there's probably going to be people in New Jersey who are going to understand and welcome uh, and hide a deserter or whatever. So I think those are some of the reasons uh, why this desertion rate is high. Of course, you have to put that in context with all the casualties, right? If you didn't have 65,000 casualties in the Overland Campaign and all the, the killing of the war, uh, then you know, I think the desertion rate for all these states uh, would be different. Now here's another fact, though, that kind of is also, I think, illuminating for the way that you know, New Jersey's place in the war. Uh, New Jersey's chance of death, in other words, you know, total deaths versus troops furnished, uh, and these numbers are a little different than the total troops, but these are the ones that we think the statistics are reliable, but we think, we think this, these numbers are, the, the rate we think is accurate uh, with these numbers. Uh, you can see here that your, New Jerseyans were less likely to be killed uh, in the Civil War than New York or Pennsylvania. They were a little bit less likely to be killed than Marylanders, uh, I mean, a, little, a little bit more likely to be killed than people from Delaware. Um, and I think that the reason for this is that they weren't completely trusted by those in charge of the army. That in general, if they wanted to have a regiment lead a frontal attack, a dangerous, difficult, important job, they didn't usually go uh, to a regiment from New Jersey uh, because they were uh, concerned about the performance of that regiment. Uh, I think that's not true of all New Jersey regiments, but I think overall you get to this statistic because when they had to make a choice, sometimes they went with the Pennsylvania regiment. And that is probably unfair. I don't think there's anything in the record that suggests that actually New Jersey soldiers ever performed anything other than admirably. Yes, they had a slightly higher desertion rate, uh, but I don't think that was during you know a battle necessarily. I don't, there's, there are some core that crumble in battles, but I don't think New Jersey is ever part of that, really. Uh, I think that really the decision is based on newspaper coverage and perception of New Jersey. New Jersey is perceived as not 100% supportive because of their government, because of their governor, because of their legislature, and that trickles into the assessment of the soldiers by the commanding generals. And that is, I think, one of the reasons why uh, you get this number uh, for soldiers from New Jersey. All right, so now we, we move on to the election of 1864. I, I skipped over some of the good news because, of course, hopefully you know, many of you do know that out of the despair of that summer of 1864, William Tecumseh Sherman pulls victory from defeat. Uh, he does eventually uh, capture Atlanta. And the real thing is that Lincoln doesn't blink. Lincoln's getting a lot of criticism of Grant and Sherman. He doesn't make any changes. Jefferson Davis is getting a lot of criticism of Joe Johnston, and Jefferson Davis yanks Joe Johnston and puts John Bell Hood in charge and tells John Bell Hood to attack Sherman. And Sherman's like, yes! Someone comes out of the trenches and attacks me! And he just cuts John Bell Hood down into pieces, and it's three terrible, disastrous battles uh, for Hood. So uh, Sherman kind of gets lucky uh, in that regard. But anyway, Sherman eventually uh, continues his campaign and takes Atlanta. Atlanta falls. When Atlanta falls, uh, that is the great victory that many people in the North were looking for. And uh, it means that Lincoln is going to be reelected in 1864. Now the question is, what percentage of the vote will he get and how will he do? But it seems pretty good after Atlanta falls that Lincoln's going to get reelected. Uh, in New Jersey, however, uh, it's a fierce race. Uh, despite the victory at Atlanta, it still seems that many New Jerseyans are going to vote for McClellan. George McClellan is now the person who's running against Lincoln in 1864. And uh, in fact, uh, you can see from right here, uh, this ballot, 
uh, not exactly a objective ballot. Elect Lincoln and the black Republican tif ticket. Uh, if you do, you're going to have a draft and ruin. And uh, uh, you should elect, in fact, uh, McClellan, who represents the Union and peace. Okay. Uh, how does New Jersey vote? Well, you may already uh, know this, but you probably don't know this fact. The Democratic legislature was alone among the states of the North in not allowing its soldiers to vote. Uh, every other northern state allowed the soldiers to vote in the field absentee. So if you were from Iowa and you were in Virginia, you could vote in the Iowa presidential election. Uh, but New Jersey's Democratic legislature said they're probably going to vote for Lincoln, so we're not going to allow them to vote. And uh, pr that, that probably was the reason that Lincoln did, in fact, lose New Jersey. Uh, it's, it would have been very close. He might have still lost, but it would have been a lot closer than it was if the soldiers uh, had been allowed to vote. Uh, but they didn't vote, and as a result, uh, Lincoln is defeated in New Jersey uh, in 1864. Uh, he only uh, wins uh, a tiny percentage of, uh, of the states that did participate in the election. He wins uh, Kentucky, uh, Maryland, uh, I mean, yeah, Kentucky, and Delaware, and New Jersey. Um, and that's it. And 91% um, electoral vote goes to Lincoln, and 55% of the popular vote uh, goes to Lincoln. But once again, it doesn't necessarily make New Jersey look good in the eyes of the other uh, states. Um, so why is it? And when you sum up the whole war, it seems that New Jersey hasn't been as supportive uh, as other states. Uh, why is that? Well, here are some of my conclusions. One uh, is the pre-existing pre-war economic ties to the South. New Jerseyans had a lot of economic and commercial connections. Southerners bought a lot of things from Newark. They brought lots of shoes from Newark. They bought lots of other products. Um, they had cultural ties to the South. The South loved and still loves uh, Princeton uh, and sent its best uh, students uh, to the Princeton Theological Seminary. Well, eventually they sent them to Union Theological Seminary, but they continued to send them to Princeton. Uh, they liked Princeton and they had, had close ties to it. Um, they also vacationed in Cape May. That was a popular uh, you know, destination for Southern planters. Uh, there was actually uh, one of the Right here in Woodbury, there was a, a, uh, um, a man who married a, uh, he met his wife who was visiting from the south uh, on one of these vacations, and they got married, and she actually inherited a plantation uh, in the south, and, and he moved uh, to the south, although he still maintained a home in Woodbury. Uh, he became a Confederate general uh, during the Civil War. Uh, his house was attacked uh, in, uh, uh, during, during, in Woodbury. His house in Woodbury was attacked during the war. Um, but in any event, uh, cultural connections with Cape May. Uh, the state was traditionally conservative on issues such as states' rights. It, had, you know, it favored the small states at the Constitutional Convention, and it, it looked favorably on states' rights more so than other northern states. Uh, it was always a, a state that had close elections and a history of division. I mean, if you look back at the, in the races in the 50s and 40s between the Whigs and the Democrats, they're always pretty close. It's not like New Jersey is, is really one, a one-party state. It's just not. It's, it's just used to having this kind of debate and criticism. Uh, and then, of course, the pacifist Quakers in southern New Jersey, uh, they were not supportive of the war effort as a whole. Some individuals were, like Cornelia Hancock and her family, but in general, uh, the Quaker community was not very supportive of the war effort because they were supportive of Lincoln, but they weren't supportive of the war. They didn't volunteer to fight in the war, and, uh, and that, that wasn't, a, wasn't a big factor, but it's, 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 it, it made it easier to be critical of the war and pro-peace because the Quaker community was here with a lengthy history of saying war is bad, peace is good, and so if you're opposed to the Lincoln administration and you're against this war like James Wall was, it's easier to get away with criticizing it because of the history of criticizing war that the Quakers have in New Jersey. Um, and then there's racism, which is also a, a part of it. I think, uh, you know, it's not a surprising thing, but racism was especially strong among the Irish immigrants who moved into New Jersey in great numbers in the 1850s. In fact, uh, that group in the north is really responsible for a lot of the uh, 
the anti-Lincoln votes, for a lot of the rioting, for a lot of the most violent of the protests against the war. Uh, so those are kind of my, my reasons for uh, why uh, New Jersey was less supportive. But I, I want to end on a little bit different note, and just to go back to what I said earlier, which is that despite all of this you know, uh, lack of support for the Union and desertion, all these other kinds of things, we should, not focus, we should not focus just on that, even if it may be the most unusual thing among the free states. We should instead focus on the fact that they supported the war with 88,000 troops, that over 6,000 New Jerseyans died uh, for the cause, uh, that in the end, although they didn't like the war effort and they were very critical of it, they never withdrew their support. They never, you know, stopped fighting for the Union. Uh, they, they were critical of the government, but that's different than, uh, than, I think, you know, not supporting the war. I think if you have to, in the end, say, was New Jersey supportive of the Union and the war, or was it not? If, you, if those are your only two choices, you have to say New Jersey was supportive of the Union. They were. They just were. Uh, you know, um, they did not send thousands of soldiers to fight for the Confederacy, right? Delaware sent a thousand soldiers to fight for the Confederacy. Yes, the guy from Woodbury went, but there wasn't a thousand New Jerseyans that fought for the Confederacy. Maryland sent 20,000 soldiers to fight for the Confederacy, right? New Jersey is not a border state. It's not Kentucky. It's not Maryland. It's not even Delaware. New Jersey is uh, the most conservative, most critical free state but it's not a border slave state, it's something else. And in the end, I think the story of New Jersey is, is the story of the strength of American democracy, right? New Jersey's story is here's, here's a group of people, here's a state that were consistently opposed to the war and the Lincoln administration, yet never seriously turned its back on a war that they didn't support, right? maintain support for the constitutionally elected president, the constitutionally elected Congress, they were not traitors to the Union. They were dissenters from policy who nevertheless supported the government. And that's the lesson of New Jersey during the Civil War. Thank you very much.